Hello everyone, I'm Ted Oakley, Managing Partner here at Oxbow, and this is one of the more exciting interviews I get to do with uh, somebody that I really, really like, Grant Williams. And uh, he has probably one of the greatest services, I think, for people to watch. And I'm, we're, you're going to see this a lot today, see how to get in touch with his services. But he, uh, Grant, I got to tell you, you get around, you do some of the best interviewing I've ever seen anywhere. Glad to have you. No, Ted, that's extremely kind. That's extremely generous of you. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, inviting me back. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to get out on a limb here and call you the uh, Johnny Carson of finance uh, <laughs> because you're a great interviewer and you get the most interesting people. Uh, and, and I should retire. Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> no, you shouldn't retire because uh, he, he, he was kind of sad afterwards. But, but anyway, I'm going to get right to it here. I was just, uh, you know, you interview so many interesting people all around the world and I'm always curious as to what you think because I think you have some of the most interesting uh, per perspective as well. Uh, but if you'll notice, I'm going to kick it off with a little bit with uh, inflation. And I included two graphs, you know, and if you look at that producer price, com uh, the consumer price index, those are really high compared to where they've been going back yeah. to 1960. What do you think about that? Well, it, it's extraordinary. I mean, it, when you look at these charts, they, 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 they seem kind of unreal. And it's only really, as you say, when you go back to uh, the early 80s that, there's any kind of perspective on these charts. You know, for, for 40 odd years, you have no perspective. This is just off the scale. But I, I think the important thing I'd, I'd stress, Ted, is that this is not a US centric chart. You know, this chart, you can pick a country in Europe and you'll see the same chart. And, and in fact, in Europe, that, that plus 18.4% in the PPI is in the high 20s and 30s in some countries, you know, Italy, Spain. Germany, it's um, it's crazy. So th this this inflationary impulse uh, is a at the moment anything but transitory. Um, though we may get a moderation simply due to base effects, and b it's not localized. You know this is this is a global inflationary pulse that is getting, as this chart suggests, out of hand in in many many places. And um, you know that's that's why we're seeing central banks so aggressively talking about and in many cases hiking rates. Um, in a desperate attempt to kind of remedy this, but um, the genie is well and truly out the bottle now. Well, if you look at their, uh, you know, their, they use the personal consumption expenditures and, and they're using their target funds and everything, it sure looks like they're behind the game here. What do you think about that? Yeah, and look, you can see it. You can see it in, in the tone of, of their communication. You can see they're desperately trying to regain some kind of credibility by talking as tough as they possibly can and, and, and try to get people comfortable that they're serious uh, in their attempt to try and tame this. And you can see it in their actions. You know, we've seen surprise rate hikes for the first time in who knows how long, uh, perhaps probably since before the global financial crisis when, uh, when Trichet and the ECB called people off guard. And we all know what, what happened after that. So it, all the signs point to the fact that, that they've got this horrendously wrong with their transitory narrative. They've got this horrendously wrong with their, we can control inflation. They've got it horrendously wrong with their, it's going to moderate back to 2% fairly quickly. You know, they, they could not have gotten this more wrong, the central bankers. And, and I'm including all of them in this. And, um, and you know, you go all over, you go all over the world. And so you get a chance to really see all of these different countries. I don't know anybody that interviews or goes more places than you. So you're obviously seeing it everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And then you, you, you know, wherever you go, it's the topic that people want to talk about. You know, if you get in an Uber or you get a taxi in just about any major city now, certainly in the developed world and, and arguably more so in some of the developing nations, you look at what's happening in Sri Lanka and, and what people want to talk about is how expensive everything is. And that, that mindset, those inflation expectations are the kind of unseen battle that, that the central banks are so desperate to win because once those expectations get anchored, as you well know, um, you know, you've got enough gray hair like me, you, you, you kind of remember how these things work back from the 70s and 80s. Once those expectations become unanchored, it's the devil's own job to try and get them back under control again. And, and that kind of, we're at that kind of tipping point, if you ask me, maybe past it. And another thing I would ask you, but again, because you go worldwide, uh, I included a graph here on housing, and obviously this is U.S. housing, and it's a lagging, you know, it's a lagging piece of evidence relative to uh, other things, but it's starting to really show. And do you see that 
worldwide too, as much as you see here in the U.S., do you think? Yeah, and I would say that America is actually, despite how nasty those charts look, America is in much better shape than places like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, even the UK. Um, you know, the housing markets right around the world, as you would expect in, in a, an era of, of incredibly low, nay zero interest rates, of course, house prices are going to go up. But the corollary of that is in an era of rising interest rates, you know, of course, houses are going to, house prices are going to go down. I mean, that's just the way it works. Houses become unaffordable rather quickly when rates go up as fast as they are. And you can see that in all the data as they come through. Um, the U.S. numbers here, and, and, and as I said, those, those Canadian, Australian, and New Zealand house prices are, are falling faster and harder because the, the bubbles there are, are way beyond where the U.S. is. And I think what surprised people is how quickly the housing market has slowed down. You know, um, it's, uh, there's still this kind of residual our housing will be all right, and, and you know it's it's a bubble elsewhere, but it's not a bubble in my local market. But just anecdotally, you know, talking to a friend in New York real estate, he said just the phone one day stopped ringing when mortgage rates got up into the you know, high five percent level, and it hasn't started ringing now they're falling. So um, you know, I think I think we're in a part of the cycle where rates are going to go lower, and people are going to get more reluctant to buy, and they'll hold off on bidding, and people who've got mortgages they can't afford are going to get perhaps shaken out of those and, and, and start to cut prices. We're seeing that already. It's a, it's a tricky situation. You know, I always said, because I was around uh, in the business in the late 70s, and you couldn't buy a home then because of the interest rates were too high. And then I told everybody last year you couldn't buy one because the price was too high. Right. You know, you had the well, interest rate. <laughs> something's got to give. You know, it's interesting, though, when rates were too high, and my first mortgage, I was talking to someone, was 12 or 13% I paid for my first mortgage. Um, but I only had to borrow fifty thousand pounds. So it, it, you know, yes, rates go up, but the compensation, the steam valve, is to let the price of the houses fall, and and the twelve thirteen percent is affordable if you pay the right price for the home. So that's the that's the danger here is that the home's correct to be affordable given the interest rates. Well, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and and talk to you about oil, and uh, I I I believe at least that. Uh, this entire administration has taken the complete wrong approach to oil in terms of, I, I, I can't even fathom what we're doing here uh, rel relative to what's going on worldwide. But I did put the price up here. But to pass that price, I put a graph in there which you could see is that Russia today has more revenues from oil than they did a year ago. And so the, the whole thing backfired. So give me your look at that whole thing. Well, I think I think it's it's probably a bit too simplistic to talk about the whole thing backfiring. I, I don't necessarily think um, the 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 intended outcome was purely to to strangle the Russians with this. I mean, this is this is a, a, a policy failure, I think, at, at, at the deepest level. And uh, you know, I'm I'm here in, in in Florida to give a speech, and I'm going to be talking about um, uh, reality, and you know. Part of that is a slide that defines reality, and rea reality is the world as it actually is, and not how we want it to be. And I think that's the key problem here for the for the Biden administration is they are enacting policies to create a world they would like to see, and ignoring the reality of the world we're in, which is one that cannot simply do away with hydrocarbon. Yes, it's a fantastic goal to be green and clean and, and make the world a better place. Of course, I don't think anybody is going to sit there and say, oh, "I would much rather the world was more polluted." But you have to be pragmatic and practical in how you do it. And so picking a, a number out of the sky and saying, we'll be net zero by 2050, and then, and then figuring out, okay, how do we do that? It's just putting the cart before the horse. And, um, you know, my, my friend Doomberg has a great saying. He says, you know, in, in the battle between platitudes and physics, physics is undefeated. And that's exactly right. That's the situation we're in. It's fine to, to create policy for an ESG um, uh, environment and try to, to – to signal that you want to make the world a better place, but you have to be practical about what you do, it, and, and, and they're just not doing that. Well, and I agree. I actually use this as just one of the side items of everything they've done because yeah. most people, I think you'd agree, Grant, have no idea how much petro, the petro is used in every product they touch. Not Forget yeah. the gasoline, okay? Just go with the other things, and I don't think they they get a handle on that. And the idea that you could switch over from something uh, that's so pervasive and then just turn well, the switch look, off. People shouldn't have to know that. 
Ted, frankly, right? The government should know that and should make policies accordingly. They, they should be the ones out messaging to people saying, look, we want to be much greener, we want to be much cleaner, and we will get there. But you have to understand that, that it's not a simple switch you can turn off. We have to work our way towards it. It's going to take time. But we will you know, be consistent in our application of policies that get us to that end goal. We, we don't know how long it'll take. But of course, that's not good enough in, in the today's world where you have to signal certain things and you have to do them now and not tomorrow. And so there we are. You know, the people are forced to understand things that they really have no need to do if you've got a, a functioning government that, that can take that burden off them. And you get a double look. I mean, if they tell you as an oil and gas company that, hey, uh, we want you to produce as much as you, we hate you, but we want you to produce yeah. as much as you can for five years. And oh, by the way, if you make a lot of money at it, we're going to really take that away from you yep. too. And then we're going to put you out of business. Yeah. <laughs> Great incentive, huh? And so, well, uh, especially if afterwards you then blame the oil and gas companies for the, and you talk about profiteering and price gouging. I mean, it's it's um, it, it's a dreadful situation. It really is, whichever way you cut it. But let me ask you this, and I'm looking now into the future, and I think some of the thing, the work you've done with Doomberg really is always really interesting because he has, he's got a lot of facts that he puts together on your show. Um, but looking ahead on the next really five to ten years, it doesn't look like, from just a balancing standpoint, that we're able to really um, get out of this thing anywhere anytime soon. Well, look, I think you. Um you have to have faith in humanity. I mean, you look at you look at what mankind has achieved, and we we tend to find answers to the problems that face us. But but what's happened, I think, in in the in the recent past is that the instead of looking at a problem and working out how to solve it, we look at a problem and then say, okay, that needs to be solved in two years or three years. And sometimes these things just don't happen. In the meantime, um, you know, policy has been made, particularly around nuclear. You know, we have we have magic rocks that give off energy. You, you couldn't write this this fairy story, and yet um, there is there is a, a climate of fear and, and a misunderstanding of the dangers of, for example, nuclear waste. And Dunberg and I had a great chat with Dr. Chris Kiefer about the realities of nuclear waste. But you know, nuclear is such a, a charged word, uh, and and people are so afraid of it that um, it. it a potential solution to the green energy problem, which is sitting right under our noses, is, is being ignored. And you know, despite what's happening in Germany, in particular, there's a refusal to turn back on nuclear power plants because what we've 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 said we're going to phase out nuclear because what Fukushima, because Chernobyl. You know, the, these the reactor at Chernobyl was built in the 50s. I mean, we're we're talking ancient technology here. Um, modern day nuclear power plants are remarkably safe. Uh, and if you build them in the right places, which Fukushima clearly wasn't, um, it's, a, it's a remarkably safe form of energy. But we're cutting off our nose to spite our faces because of, of you know, public fear and, and misunderstanding of, of the realities of the situation. So let me, uh, I'm going to switch a little bit for you here and go to the dollar. And I know uh, you get a chance to look at a lot of countries and a lot of things that are going on. You know, this dollar's been on a run now since uh, May of 21. Uh, do you see that continuing? Look, I, I, I can see how it could continue. Absolutely. Um, I feel like it's perhaps reaching a plateau right now, not, not, uh, not an Irving Fisher plateau, a permanently high plateau. Um, but I feel like that, that chart is going to start to moderate and we could see the dollar correct here. Um, you know, the federal reserve were out in front of this. Other central banks are starting to realize they have to play catch up fast. So you, you're going to, you're going to start to you know, mitigate the, the interest rate differential. Um, and the dollar is is remarkably stretched right now. So in the short term, I would completely expect to see a pullback in the dollar. Uh, what happens to it from there is really going to depend on policy decisions. And as we've seen in recent months, God only knows what they're going to be. I mean, we've seen um, policy decisions in Australia um, and Canada uh, laughable U-turns there that, that have caused tremendous embarrassment to the central banks. But any any right-thinking, sane watcher of a situation realized that they couldn't continue through all the promises they've made. So we're going to start to see uncertainty around policy. And you know, if the Fed, when they, um, I'm not sure when this will air, but the Fed are meeting tomorrow, um, and the chances are that they will try and move away from forward guidance, which was such an important. Um, tool for them over the last decade plus. And if they move to a data-dependent um, uh, 
uh, approach, which they're likely to do, that I think sets the stage for them to cut sooner rather than later. Um, even if it's because interest uh, because inflation has moderated from you know nine percent down to six percent, they can say, well, it's headed back towards two percent. We know it's going to get there, so we're going to you know we're going to stop hiking or we're going to ease. I think that will unleash a lot more problems than it solves, but it but it remains to be seen. Well, and on that count, uh, there's a graph here I showed you too that is on the dollar versus the euro. And we it goes back. We have to go back 20 years to get a one on one. Uh, which is about where you are now, not quite, but I mean, you're, you're close. And uh, it's been a long time since that happened. Uh, that, and so it's interesting. And I saw, and I know you uh, obviously uh, very familiar with the UK because you live there, but uh, I just saw yesterday where the UK uh, confidence level was the lowest since they kept records going back to 1974. Yeah. Yeah, and, and look, we, we Brits are not the most confident of people at the best of times. So that's a uh, that's a remarkably low, remarkably low reading. But again, look, University of Michigan is a similar story. You know, the, the, we're seeing we're seeing um, uh, levels which uh, you have to go back a long, long, long way to find. Even through, you know, 08, even through 2000, um, people's confidence is is lower than those things because it's not just a stock market story. It's not just a crash in the housing markets, or just a crash in in stock markets. It's a cost of living problem. It's it's people's confidence is low because they they realise they can't afford to feed their families, and the chance of them being able to do so without constant pressure is something they can't see on the horizon. So it, it's understandable that um, that this kind of crisis of confidence is is a different beast to the ones that that we've seen at those other lows. I mean, you go back to the seventies, and then you'll see a kind of a, a similar comparison. And on that same note, uh, Grant, uh, if you look at the about face that they did in Australia, you know, they were going down this path that you're talking about. And, and you might mention that. And then also, do you think following that up that Japan is going to be forced to do the same thing? Yeah, I, Australia's interesting. You know, the Australian Central Bank came out and, and basically said to people, and, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, but really not much. That there there wouldn't be any rate hikes until 2024 at the earliest is what they came out and said, um, and of course they were forced into a, a rather embarrassing U-turn a, a few months ago. And the governor of the Bank of uh, Royal Bank of Australia, uh, Dr. Philip Lowe, was kind of issued a mea culpa on, on national TV about how wrong they got it. You look at Canada and Tiff Macklem, the same thing. The Bank of Canada went out and said to people, you know, if you are looking to take on a mortgage, and if you are a business, or if you're looking to make a big purchase, don't worry, interest rates are going to stay low for a long time. Now, how do you do that, encourage people to take on debt, um, and then turn around and say, oh, we got it wrong, we're hiking rates? I mean, it's, it's, it's shocking. I mean, in, in Australia, the, the, the Royal Bank of Australia is under review now, um, you know, for getting it so wrong. Uh, APRA, the, the regulator, is also under review. So, so things are happening. Um, and it's problematic. Japan is is arguably the kind of the, the biggest one of all, and the canary in the coal mine for many many reasons, because they have had this long experiment with with negative rates, quantitative easing, and now um, yield curve control, where they're pegging the yield of the ten year JGB. And you know what's changed there, Ted, is is for the first time we're starting to see the yen weaken dramatically. Um, which is always the, the escape valve for, for these kind of pressures. And we're starting to see investors uh, take on the Bank of Japan and, and just kind of probe how strongly they're going to defend that point on the yield curve. We've seen the JGB futures blow out. We've seen the 10-year point on the curve exceed the, Japan, the Bank of Japan's limit, even though there are unlimited bid there, supposedly. So things are changing in Japan. And, and finally, um, markets are starting to see vulnerability in the central banking ranks. And, and given how artificial these markets have become and how artificial prices that have uh, heavy central bank involvement have become, there is some real money to be made if you can take the other side of that trade and it has to unwind, some real money. So as the likelihood that the central banks are caught offside and have to correct gets higher, the pressure on them in terms of people looking to take the other side of the trade is going to increase dramatically. And that's a recipe for some real fireworks, I think. And, you know, that would probably make the bond correction in the U.S. look mild compared absolutely. to well, yeah, yeah, what could happen there, don't you think? 
Yeah, no, exactly right. I mean, Japan has been at this for 20 years and they've kind of been left alone. And it's important to note that the structure of the JGB market is very different. They're not widely owned internationally. Most of those bonds are owned domestically. And that's one of the reasons it's been able to continue for so long. But still, you're starting to see um, pressure there. And, uh, and if that cracks, it's, uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a big sign that central banks are losing control of the narrative. And that, that will ripple through every major country in the world, for, for sure. Which uh, leads me to the next question with the next graph, which shows gold. And obviously, it's pulled back yeah. into the low 1700s. But do you think just what you just got through talking about would have an impact on the gold price? Uh, you look, I mean, what any of us think ought to happen to gold has been proven to be uh, to be off base for such a long time. And and look, that 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 is absolutely true if you focus on the price of gold as as your arbiter. And, and I understand why that that's seemingly a flip statement, but but to to me it isn't. I've talked about this so often. I'm kind of tired of hearing myself talk about it. But the point where gold is going to be valuable to own, and, and, and by valuable I mean the price will move up like people expect it to, is when people feel a need to own gold. They haven't felt that need for quite some time. They felt it back in, in, in 2011 when the price soared up to 1900, um, you know, amidst sort of debt crisis and, and um, U.S. potential defaults by the U.S. People felt a need to own gold and the price reflected that. They felt that need in the depths of the pandemic and the price shot through $2,000. Right now, people don't feel like they need to own gold. You know, and, and gold is is a very finite supply. So if people need to own gold, then they have to buy gold, and to do that, they're going to have to pay higher prices. So, you know, I, as I say, the gold I hold, um, I just add to uh, as time goes by, and I don't worry about the price because I, I know when I need that gold, and other people need to own it. It's not going to trade hands lower. It's going to trade hands higher. And at that point, I may decide to exchange it for something else. But, but you know, it's it's unlikely. I think when you need to own gold, there's a reason for that, and you'd be crazy to give up the gold you own at that particular point. So so we'll see. But uh, you know, the, the price action has been incredibly disappointing for people who bought it expecting the price to go higher. I think for anyone who's bought it expecting it to be a store of value, it's it's fine. I mean, there's nothing to worry about. You know, I would say something to that. Uh, one of your interviews, by the way, and you have so many interesting interviews on your podcast, but one was with Dan Oliver. Yeah. Uh, and he had a, the, your conversation with him about that over the next, you know, two to five years was really interesting. So I would recommend people when they use your podcast to really listen to that interview. It was really a great interview, I thought, all the way around, by the way. Yeah, Dan, Dan is, um, he's a remarkable man. He's a great thinker and he's a, he's a, a real student of history. So I think when Dan talks about these things, there's a there's an intellectual weight behind it that that perhaps you don't get from people who just comment on the gold price. You know, Dan understands monetary history and it, and he's a great lens through which to kind of reshape the way you look at things like gold. I think. Well, I'm going to move to the subject here as far as the stock market. You know, people want to talk about it a lot. Um, obviously, as a firm, we've been really cautious the last year and a half. We got a lot of pressure on us for that, but it's paid off this year. But the main point I was going to ask you was, you know, I don't think we've even, it doesn't seem like we've even gotten to the point, the earnings have to be under pressure the next two or three quarters, but does it seem to you or do you feel like that's in the price yet? No, not even close. I don't think that, that process has, has even begun. You know, if you look at the PE ratios, we've seen the re-rating in P. We haven't seen that in the E side of the equation yet. We're starting to see it. You know, Walmart came out yesterday, and that was a, a bit of a surprise to some, um, not a surprise to others. McDonald's also, and if, if stocks like McDonald's and Walmart are struggling, given where we are in the cycle and given the unaffordability of things, um, that's a huge, a huge red flag to me. And, and I think you, you always see Wall Street analysts are always optimistic with their with their profit forecasts until the depths of of corrections, in which case they get overly bearish. They're still bullish about prospects. They're still either listening to companies try to keep their stock prices high by, by, by painting the rosiest picture they can, or they're looking for investment banking business. Um, but we always see this. We always see earnings expectations among Wall Street analysts take a long, long time 
before they start getting realistic. And we're nowhere near that yet. They haven't started re-rating anything yet. And so that that little um, piece of the fun ride is still to come, I suspect. Well, and that's why I included this grab, because you could see the earnings estimate moving higher while the index is crashing. And it's always yeah. the same. And I told somebody last week, I said, hey, if you adjust the earnings, your, your multiple is not 16 or 17 now, it's 22. <laughs> so... That's exactly right. And, and look, this chart goes back, what, a year and change? Yeah, January of 21. Maybe. January 21. Yeah, 18 months. So if you if you look at this chart, if you zoom out and you see it, you'll see that, that, that the stock market leads earnings results always. The stock market has to crash before any any analyst starts to lower their, their forecasts. Um, so I think it's it's a really useful to see a chart like this that shows you how far away from reality they've gotten. But I think relying on Wall Street analysts for earnings as a potential barometer for the health of the stock market is a, is a fool's errand, Frank. So a couple of last questions I want to ask you that really don't have any pertain, they don't pertain to charts, uh, but you always have a very eloquent way of, um, of looking at things, I should say, when you're discussing them. One of the things I wanted to ask you is this, and this seems this way to us as a firm, and that is, if you look at people's trust today, if you take the combination of the regulatory authorities, public companies, politicians, state governments, the federal government, it seems as though, at least where we go all over the US anyway, that people have no trust today that anybody is actually going to do the right thing. Do you, you sense that? Yeah, I know, absolutely. And um, again, this is something um, I, I keep going back to to Bill Strauss and Neil Howe's book, The Fourth Turning, because they talk about this. And uh, as as difficult as it is and as, and as strange as it seems to us that, that trust is fracturing, and you know, people talk about it wide eyed and say, you know, it, could that be true? But this is something, a pattern that repeats throughout history. You know, every 80 to 100 years, trust in institutions breaks down because the people in those institutions who we do trust to, to, to make our lives better fail. Um, and it's okay to fail, but you have to own it and move on. And generally what happens when these institutions fail, like the, the, the central banks being a perfect example, government being another, they tend to try and cover up their failures rather than coming clean and saying, look, you know, this is, we, we screwed up. And, and because we screwed up, there's going to be some suffering and some pain for us to fix it. They don't want to take the blame for that, so they obfuscate and they and they try to redirect people's angst in in other directions. And ultimately, society understands what's happened. They've been lied to, um, and of course, trust breaks down if you've been lied to. That's just the cycle. And so we're at that part, unfortunately, where trust in institutions starts to fade, and people tend to get angry once they lose their trust and they realize they've been lied to. So that that's the that's the fourth turning that Bill and Neil wrote so beautifully about in the book. And any, anyone who hasn't read that book should really um, find time to read it because it, it, it's such a, it's such a incredibly thought provoking illustration of, of two things. One, it describes exactly where we are and, and what's likely to happen next. But B, it demonstrates that this is nothing new. This is a perfectly rational response to a cyclical phenomena that, um, to, that, that occur over over long periods of time, and and they tend to happen when all the people who can remember the last time they happened have died off. That's why they take every you know eighty uh, to a hundred years to happen. It, you you have to lose the generation that remembers it before for people to say, hey, you know, what, this has never happened before. Yes, it has, but all the people that experienced it are now sadly no longer with us. Well, and it's interesting because we've interviewed uh, at Oxboy, we've interviewed Neil numerous times, and I spent some time with him. We were both uh, yeah. speaking together at, in uh, January, but he has a new book coming out in 23, he tells me, the early part. It'll be interesting to see the follow-up, but I wanted to add something there. One of the things that you did this year uh, that was really good, it's part of your service, was you gave a speech to Edelweiss, and that was... Um, God, it was a really, uh, that described a lot of what we're talking about right here. I thought you did a really great job on that. Well, that's, that's very kind of you. And, and funny enough, um, it's the first time I've done it, but the speech I'm going to give here in uh, Florida in a couple of days' time, I've, I've basically taken that speech as the core of it because I think it's just so important to, to, to look not at markets and not at 
precious metal prices and not a um, you know bond yields and all these things that we've become accustomed to gauging the health of the stock market, the financial markets, and thereby uh, by extension society. I think it's important to flip that around now and start looking at the health of society first, and use that as a lens to understand the kind of uh, problems we might see in risk asset prices. And and I think that the tail has been wagging the dog for some time now, and and now those core principles. The, the, the things that are fundamental to functioning markets and trust in institutions uh, are crumbling. So it's important to understand why, how we got here, and what's likely to happen next. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm keen to to try and have as many people as possible understand that because I think to your point, it's it's incredibly important to realize that that's the part of the cycle we're in now. And my last question to you uh, would be this, and that it has to do with what we're talking about right here. But this has been building up now over a ten year period. But my question to you is this, and then has you, have you ever, did you ever think you would see the level of greed that moved into everything the last, say the last five years, pick to the last two, uh, where it was all about the money. It was not, it was about, I've never, I never thought I'd see it to that level in my career, but we, we've seen it. I'm just curious if you ever thought you would see that like it is now. Look, sadly, Ted, I, I, I did. I mean, I, I, and for two reasons. One, um, as I say, there's nothing new under the sun, as my dear friend Simon Mikhailovich likes to say. Um, and this has all happened before. You know, go back to the 1920s. It was a very similar scenario. Again, most of the people who remember that are gone. So we don't have any frame of reference for it. But also, you know, I, I go back to Charlie Munger's fantastic statement. You know, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcomes. And when you incentivize people, to, to, to worship at the altar of greed and opulence and, and bling and lavish extravagance, that's what's going to happen. So you know, I, I think when you, when you glorify money and you glorify wealth as, as the, the be-all, end-all, you end up with people doing crazy things to, to achieve those ends. And so you know, uh, it, it saddens me a tremendous amount to say that this doesn't surprise me even the extent of it, I think. I think what surprised me, perhaps, is 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 the breadth of it, rather than the extent of it. I, I think that the, the breadth of it, with the, with the rise of social media, has meant that, that people who to whom the, the chase of this kind of thing is is dangerous have been sucked into it, and, and, and in a way that that has has made them feel inadequate if they didn't have the kind of wealth that's been glorified, and it's. It's incredibly dangerous, and, and we will we will see that unravel, and we're seeing the first phase of it now. I mean, you know, my, my dear friend Steve Diggle said to me in an interview um, a while ago, uh, you know, talking about the, the, the disparity in, in, in wealth around the world, and he, and he's, he made a great point. He said, look, it's, it's, it's never a good time to be poor, but we are coming to a time where it's going to be a terrible thing to be rich. And I think we're starting to see the beginnings of that. We're starting to see resentment. Uh, you know, America, for me, growing up in the UK, America was always this shining beacon where you could, you could go. And if you worked hard and, and worked well, you could become successful and people would admire you for it. Um, you know, that was not really the attitude in places like England or Australia that have this kind of tall poppy syndrome where if you become successful, people resent them and jealous of you. America was never like that to me growing up in the 70s. In the 80s and, and 90s, um, but that seems to change now. And 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 the last people who understand that always are the really wealthy people who flaunt their wealth a little bit too long. And we're seeing that with the way the narrative is turning on on some of the Silicon Valley billionaires. You know that that's turning now. The private jets, the yachts, the champagne, all that stuff starts to look very gauche when people uh, can't afford to fill up their gas tank. So. Uh, it's it's really sad, Ted, and, and and it's 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 got a ways to go yet, and the unraveling of it all will, will be painful, I'm afraid. You know, too, if you ever want to read, uh, I tell this to people out there. A great, there's a good book out there called Rainbow's End, and it's about the opulence of the 20s and the crash uh, after 29, and 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 it really plays out everything you just described. But it goes into a lot of detail. Great book to read. That uh, I haven't read it. I'll look that up. I appreciate that. Thank you. Of, you had met a few years ago. But listen, Grant, uh, I know you're a busy man, and I want to thank you very much for taking the time. And we, during this, uh, we've really put up 
Um, you know, uh, if you look at things that make you go, hmm, which is your trademark of everything you do, I highly recommend people to look at everything that comes, really comes from every angle of what you do, your interviews, your written copy, your podcast. It's all, uh, you're one of the best, my friend. I wanted to let you know. That's very kind. I'm humble. Thank you, Tim. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for being with us, and we hope to see you back next year. Great pleasure. Anytime. Okay. Thanks.